Good morning to everyone, uh, friends new and old. Um, thank you for coming to Data Analytic Colloquium today. Um, we're pleased to, to have you all here. Uh, before we formally start uh, with Professor Zhang, and let me just give you a little bit of background about this colloquium. Uh, Data Analytic Colloquium is sponsored and supported by National Zhongxin University, uh, College of Law and Politics, and the University of Texas at Dallas, uh, School of Economic, Pol uh, Political, and Policy Sciences, EPPS. Um, it, this is the second year, I mean, or the second season uh, of the, the stack, and uh, we try and uh, we have been invited, uh, and this is our goal, and we try to um, convene all the international scholars, uh, mostly the top-notch scholars and data scientists, in, uh, and then we have this online seminar uh, or workshops. Uh, we're hoping that uh, through this colloquium, uh, we can share uh, this um, methodology, uh, especially in political methodology, and to, to all our students and all uh, interested guests here. So, um, and um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, just let uh, Professor Hall to introduce uh, Professor Zhang, uh, today's guest. Um, so uh, I hope that you can enjoy today's today's topic and the talk. Um, Carl? Hello, thank you, uh, Dr. Pan. Uh, thank, for, thank you for giving me an opportunity. My name is Carl Ho. I'm the co-host of the uh, Data Analytics Colloquium. Today I'm introduced to you, I'm introducing, introducing to you a very special guest uh, our, uh, it's really our honor to have uh, Professor Zhang, uh, Professor uh, Ji Yong Zhang of the University of Notre Dame to come to give a very special talk. And uh, Dr. Zhang is a professor in quantitative psychology uh, in the University of Notre Dame. And uh, his research focuses on uh, uh, developing better statistical methods and the software uh, in the area of education, health, management, and psychology. He's not only a professor, he's also an application developer. And uh, he's con he has conducted research in the area of basic methods, big data analysis, uh, structural regression modeling, longitudinal data analysis, mediation uh, analysis, statistical computing and programming. Uh, his most recent research involved uh, the development of new methods for social network and text anal uh, uh, analysis in the framework of uh, structural equation structural equation modeling. Uh, recently started a new journal. Uh, the journal is called the Journal of Behavioral uh, Data Science. And this is a journal bridging uh, data science, uh, data analytics, quantitative methods uh, in behavioral uh, uh, research. And uh, Dr. Chan is also uh, uh, a, a, a editor of some multiple journals. And uh, he's um, uh, recently, he just started this uh, this journal. I think this is uh, is also the uh, the associate editor of uh, Neural Computing, and uh, he's uh, uh, also associate correct director of a uh, multivariate behavioral research, and he's also uh, receiving multiple awards, uh, including the most recent uh, Tanaka Award for Best Article in Multivariate yeah. Behavioral Research. I think there's a lot of things I want to carry, and it could take me an hour or so to, to really give the full, full list of accolades of Dr. Chan. I think, I think uh, without further ado, I would just, sorry, yes, or, sorry for the echo. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our very, uh, uh, our honored guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Ji Yong Zhang. Johnny, this is, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ho for the introduction and, and both Carl and Peter for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor to speak to you about my recent research. So in the past few years, uh, the students and I in my lab have conducted several research in the area of social network analysis. So today I will share some of the results with you. Hopefully you will find them interesting. So I will first talk about the uh, social network data and the social network analysis very briefly. And um, I'm not sure how about how much you know about the structure equation modeling. So in case you don't, so I will also give you some uh, 
uh, introduction to structure equation modeling. And after that, I will discuss how to conduct the social network analysis uh, in the framework of SEM structure equation modeling. Particularly, I present three studies. And in the first study, we see how we can predict the network with the latent effect space. So that's a combination of network analysis and effect analysis. Uh, in the second study, I will introduce you a cross-section network mediation analysis. In this case, we treat a network as a mediator, as in SEM. And in the third study, I will introduce the longitudinal network median median model. Uh, so we have longitudinal network data. So how to treat uh, longitudinal network data in SEM? So this is a, a kind of attempt to use the, the longitudinal network information in structure equation modeling. Finally, I will discuss uh, future directions regarding this work. Uh, social network analysis now is quite a popular research topic in many different areas. Uh, for example, in statistics, sociology, political science, and the psychology. Um, actually, the psychologists have used the network analysis um, long times ago, but there is some new uh, interest in in network analysis in recently because of the new development of network techniques, particularly in computer science and statistics. Using a, a network, we can evaluate the social structures by looking at the relationship among, like for example, subjects in your network. And we also call those subjects as nodes or intended is in different uh, uh, areas. For example, in economics, we can look at how social, economic, and technology worlds uh, connected together. And in political science, we can look at how social network is related to individuals' political preference. And we can also use network analysis in epidemiology. And particularly now, we have the COVID-19 pandemic. So the contact track contact tracing, for example, is one way to use a network analysis. And in sociology and psychology particularly, we are more interested in uh, how we can explain the different patterns or different structures in social networks. And in education research, social network analysis has been found useful in detecting and preventing um, bullying behaviors among students. So therefore, there are many different kinds of applications of social network analysis in different areas. And in my study, I will focus on the application in psychology. So that's my, uh, that's, that's the department that I work in. Before I introduce those different models we developed in my lab, I will first introduce the data set. And we only use part of the data in our analysis. However, I will give you more information about this data set because we collected the data set by ourselves. So in case you are interested in- uh, Johnny, uh, Johnny, I'm sorry to interrupt. Somehow I cannot see your slides moving. Uh, in my screen is still showing the first slide. Uh, other people are seeing the slides too? Do you see the slides, uh, Peter? Yeah, I can see the slides now. Yeah. All right. Can you see? Can you see it now? Uh, yeah. This is uh, example this is page eleven. Set, yeah. yeah, this is page eleven now. Yeah. Mm -hmm, Thank you. Mm -hmm, that's right. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, as I said, I want to give you more information about the data set. Uh, if you are interested in network analysis, uh, for example, if you want to use our data for some data analysis or for trying some of the methods, just let me know. Okay. So the data were collected mm -hmm. from uh, 180 college students, uh, actually in a college in China. Uh, after removing some invalid uh, like information, for example, um, it's very clear from the response, some students didn't pay attention to the questions at all. So the response um, with the same answer to every question. So we removed some, some of those participants. Uh, eventually we have a sample of 162 participants. This can be considered as a relatively large uh, network already. And in this sample, there are 90 female students and 72, 90 female students and 72 male students. Uh, during the data collecting, we got some basic information, for example, the age, uh, weight and the height of each student, and the number of WeChat friends they, they have, uh, as well as their GPA. Hello, Johnny. I, I'm sorry, the slide is just stop at uh, the first bullet bullet point. And let, I see still moving. Okay, that's strange. Let me, let me try to... Share the screen. You may to try to share screen instead yeah. of share window. Maybe share a screen, maybe easier. Uh -huh. Two options. Let yeah. me see if I can. Yeah, please, uh, please uh, share screen when you share content. How about now? Can you see the slide? Yeah, okay, we can see now. We can see now. Can you move one bullet point? Maybe. Let me see. You see the moving? How about now? Yeah, Is now we can see. Can it move move back one slide? Yeah, we can see now. Okay. Great. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, probably there's some problem with my computer. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, it could be teams. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, in addition to the basic uh, background information, we also collected some uh, psychological data. For example, uh, we use the 20 item MIDI IPIP to measure the big five personality uh, of the participants. And we also get the information on depression using the personal health questionnaire. And then we collect data on loneliness and happiness using two different scales. Um, finally, one of the main purpose of this study is to look at the relationship between network and alcohol use and the smoking behavior. So therefore, we ask the students whether they have ever uh, drunk uh, alcohol and whether they have ever smoked like uh, cigarettes before. So this is the descriptive information of the variables we have collected. Uh, those only partial of the information we didn't include all the variables. So this is a uh, basic information. For example, the average age uh, of the participants is about 21.6 uh, years. Uh, minimum is 18 and the maximum is 22. And also like uh, uh, we calculated the BMI based on height and weight. Um, so those five variables are the bigger Five personality scales. So we calculate the, the composite score for each uh, types of personality, for example, extroversion, imagination. Uh, so the score will range from one to five. And then we get the depression and loneliness. Depression and loneliness range from zero to three, and happiness is from one to seven. And among those Group of among this group of students, um, forty three students have smoked before, and that's about thirty six percent, and about forty one percent of participants have drunk alcohol before. Uh, 
And then we get the information on the friendship network. And the network information is collected using uh, the following way. For each student, for each student, we give a list of all the students in the study. So basically, they need to take a look at the names of 180 students. And then we ask them to report their relationship with each student, each student on this list. Uh, the relationship is measured by a five point length scale uh, with one indicating um, the student um, never heard about the, st the students on the list at all. And um, two means uh, heard about the students, but there was no personal interaction. And um, three is, means like met the students a few times. Four means the, the student is a friend. And five means the student is one of the best friends. One of the best friends. Uh, in the studies I'm going to discuss, so we actually change the five leg five point length scale to a binary data. So for the category one, two, three, we give a value zero. For four and five, we give a value one. So therefore we get a uh, one means the two students are friends. Zero means not. So it becomes a binary network or unweighted network. Uh, this network plot based on the binary network. Uh, so if there is a, a line between two dots here, first each dot in this plot represents a student. If there's a connection between the two dots, which means the two students are friends or best friends. Um, if there's no connection between the two, which means the two students are not friends. Okay. Uh, in this plot, uh, we also distinguish like male and female students using different colors. And from the plot, we can see like um, there are roughly uh, five different groups. So this can be used as group of students, another group of students, and here. And in the network analysis, the network plot or network visualization is actually a very important part of network analysis because using uh, the network plot, we can see a lot of uh, interesting information among this group of uh, participants or nodes in your network. So putting together the data, we would have a data look like this. Uh, so each row is still represent the information from one participant or one student in this case, right? And the columns can have different information. So th the first part here represents the network data. Notice that the network data is constructed here using a matrix. So I have five, six different persons or six different students in this case. Uh, on each column and on each rows, there are also the same six students, okay? Uh, on the diagonals, I put N there means uh, I don't allow a student to identify himself or herself as as a as a friend so which means you cannot view yourself as a friend okay mm -hmm. uh, then the number zero means uh, student one student two are not friends okay one means student one student three are friends so using this matrix we can represent the relationship among uh, all the students in the study so this part of the data is the network data. And then we have other types of data like age and gender, smoke, alcohol use, and one of the big five factors. And so usually the gender and the age can be used as predictors to explain something. And then we can treat smoke and alcohol use as well as personality as outcomes. Certainly, we can also use those as predictors too, if you want. Many methods are already available to conduct network analysis. And particularly, the traditional network analysis oftentimes focus on 
uh, modeling the network itself. For example, uh, we only look at the structure among a group of participants. For example, um, in this structure, we can look at the something called the density of the network. Density means how many like connections uh, among those network over the total possible connections. Right? So here we have six participants. Um, we can connect all of them together. So that's a total number of possible connections. But we only observe this amount of now this number of connections. So in this case, we can look at the density. If we have a higher density, which means there are more connections in the network. And we can also look at the triangles, for example, uh, how many uh, a, a triangle represents us. There is a connection among any three participants, right? So we can count how many of those triangles we have in your network. So oftentimes, like uh, those basic uh, information can already be very useful uh, to study your network. Uh, there is a set of models called the exponential random graph models. Uh, it's, it's also called the exponential family random graph models. Uh, so this model basically treats this uh, network, the overall network, as a random variable. Right? So if we have six, um, six participants or six nodes in the network, right? we can generate many different kinds of network with different kind of connection. Right? So this network basically is a uh, uh, observation of all those possible networks. So the network itself can be used as a random variable. And then we can model this network using the different properties of the network. For example, uh, how many connections in the network, how many triangles in the network, and some other information. Uh, recently, there's a new model called the latent space model. Uh, latent space model basically um, is a statistical model. And in this statistical model, uh, it assumes uh, whether there is a connection between two nodes or not. For example, where, whether the two students are friends or not can be determined by some latent variables. It's called a Z. Uh, in this situation, we can view Z, Z as a latent location in, in, like, uh, in a space. Uh, one example to look at here, for example, if we have a, a two dimensional space, and in this latent space, we can put each person there. For example, one person could be here, another person is here, right? Uh, the latent space model assumes like uh, if two persons are closer in the space, it's more likely for them to be collect, collect, connected. For example, if the two persons uh, have a similar score on Z1 and Z2, uh, then the two, the two persons are more likely to become friends. Okay? Uh, if their position are far away in this space, and uh, this less likely for them to become friends. Okay? So that space can be viewed as a logistic regression. Right? So each YG represents the zero and one data in our network. But from that, we can estimate Z and ZJ. ZI basically is a score for S person. ZJ is for the Js person. So it's kind of like in this uh, space, this is for, this is maybe ZI and this is maybe ZJ. Okay. Um, we can calculate the distance using many different ways. Right? So this just, for example, we can use like a Euclidean uh, distance to look at the distance between uh, two participants in the latent position. Okay. So this is considered latent variable modeling. And if you are familiar with uh, factor analysis, it can be viewed as factor scrub. Um, then I will give you a brief introduction about the structure equation modeling. Structure equation models are a collection of different models. For example, regression analysis can be viewed as a special case of ICM. And the mediation analysis is another special case, as well as fact analysis and the mimic models. Uh, the advantage of the SEM is it's kind of combine many different models into a general model. And in this case, we can easily expand this model for uh, very complex data analysis. 
And with SEM, it uh, bring a great advantage to uh, researchers who are not familiar with statistical models or SEM, for example. Uh, we don't need to focus on how to estimate the model anymore. We can just focus on building a model. Building a model basically means you can build a theory and then use SEM to test your theory. And because of this, like uh, SEM is very widely used. Uh, think about it in this way. In the past, if you need to do a t-test, right, and you have to think about how to do a t-test, how to divide like uh, uh, test statistics. And if you need to do a regression, and then you need to learn how to fit the regression model. For example, use uh, ordinary least square or uh, maximum likelihood. And if you need to conduct the NOVA analysis, and then you you need to think about how to do a NOVA, how to calculate those source tables. Right? Uh, in that case, you have to worry about how to actually uh, conduct the analysis based on each individual model. But in SEM, we can put all those models as uh, special cases of SEM. And once we know how to estimate an SEM model, we kind of uh, uh, learn, how, learn how to estimate uh, each individual models. I'll give you some example for the regression. So this is the regression model. We use the diagrams, so we have four predictors and one outcome variable. As we know, oftentimes we use equations, we write out the model in this way. I didn't re include the residuals here. And for the model, oftentimes we have a, uh, epsilon here. But notice that this is the regression model with four predictors. So using an SEM pass diagram, uh, we can draw the model in this way. Okay. So this is the mediation model. And a mediation model basically tells us uh, whether there is a third variable that can explain uh, the relationship between an input and an output. Okay. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, mediation model because I will use it in the future. Uh, in, in, in the, in, next in my studies. Uh, so for example, like in um, this model, we have three variables. So this is called the mother's education, and this is called the home environment, and this is mass test score. Uh, research has found mass education is related to mass achievement. So which means uh, if mass education is higher, uh, it's more likely uh, cho their children will have a, a better performance on mass test. Yeah. Uh, why is that the case? So we may use some other variables to explain why is that the case. So one possible one possible explanation is uh, this relationship can be explained by home environment, which means uh, if mother has higher education, uh, the mothers will create a better home environment for their children. So with a better home environment, uh, the children can learn better. So therefore they can perform better uh, in math test. Okay. So therefore uh, home environment actually explain why math education is related to math test, math test score. Okay. Um, the mediation effects can be characterized by alpha times beta. So um, in psychology, we call this mediation effect. In political science and sociology, oftentimes it's called the indirect effect. So there's an indirect effect from uh, mass education through home environment to mass. Uh, this path is also called the direct effect, so which means uh, mass education, education also directly influence children's mass test score. Okay, so I have indirect effect and direct effect. And the indirect effect is called a mediation effect. Uh, this is a simple mediation model. Um, basically, we can use two regression equations to represent uh, the simple mediation model. The first regression is a simple regression. We have mass equation to predict home environment. And the second equation is a, a multiple regression. We have both home environment and mass equation uh, to predict the mass test score at the same time.
Um, there's a model called the fact analysis. Fact analysis is about like latent variables. For example, uh, if we are interested in measure uh, health or intelligence, uh, as we know, like it's very hard to assign score to see like uh, uh, how how healthy how how like um, healthy you are and the level of intelligence or cognitive ability. Right? Oftentimes, to measure those. Uh, we use like multiple measures. For example, we can give a mass test uh, to people. We can give verbal test to people. Uh, we give like reasoning uh, test to people. And uh, those are tests that can be easily scored. And uh, so those information are observed the information. We can directly get the information through some kind of test. And uh, so intelligence can be measured by those different tests. Right. So therefore, we can extract some information from those observed scores. And uh, then we call this like as a factor or a latent variable. Okay. Similarly, regarding health, we can measure BMI of people, we can measure blood pressure of people, heart rate of people. Right. So those information we can directly get uh, from, from people. Right. Uh, to quantify the health of a people, and then we can extract information from it, and then we can form a, another factor or latent variable we call the health here. Okay. Um, then we can look at the relationship between health and intelligence or cognitive ability. Uh, notice that uh, those variables are latent variables. We don't directly uh, measure. Uh, those variables are called observed variables. We can use some kind of test to get the information. And if we use the equations, uh, we have equations like this. Those lambdas are called like effect loadings. So that's basically the path from each individual factor to the uh, data we collect. Uh, this is a more general like kind of SDM model. Uh, we can we want to measure something called the reasoning ability. Reasoning ability can be measured by three uh, tests. So we give the three tests to participants, and then we can get a latent effect score here. And then we want to know uh, what the factors are related to reasoning ability. And then we can look at the uh, effect of education and whether gender, there's a gender difference uh, in reasoning ability. Uh, notice that in this case, we first get this part. This is the factor model. Yeah? So we have here. And then the top part, this part is a regression analysis. Right? We talked about multiple regression earlier. So therefore, this model can be um, viewed as a combination of fact analysis and regression. Okay. Certainly, the model can be made more complex. We can have multiple factors. Uh, we can have many more like uh, uh, predictors or outcome variables. Right. For example, uh, the reasoning ability can further predict something, so we can add it into the model. Um, this is another example, it's called a longitudinal mediation model. It's also called cross leg pattern mediation model. Uh, earlier, I talked about mediation analysis. I, see, I said we have three variables, right? And then the M is the mediator. Uh, but now we have measures at different times. So we have X, the predictor, uh, measured at time one, time two, and time three. And we also have mediator measured at time one, time two, and time three, as well as the outcome variable. And in this cross leg pattern mediation model, we assume, okay, uh, the predictor first will change the medi mediator at time two. The mediator at time two will, will then change the outcome at time three. Yeah. Uh, so basically, in the in this model, we consider the time sequence uh, in a study. For example, uh, if we do have mediation, certainly we would expect okay, uh, there's some sequence. Yeah. Uh, so if we look at this simultaneously, which means uh, x change, the change in x will cause immediate immediate change in m, and uh, then the change in m will cause immediate change in y. But the mediation oftentimes implies uh, there's a lag effect here, right? Uh, 
we first have some uh, change in x. After where we see the change in, or we observe the change in m, and then we observe the change in, uh, in y in the outcome. So therefore, this model probably can reflect uh, your theory better than cross cross-sectional mediation model only using data from a, a given time point. And all those models are special cases of a generalized EM model. Uh, for example, uh, this is called the least real representation of the SEM model. And in, S, in this SEM model, we have observed the data X and Y, and then we have factors cosine and uh, eta here. And then we can further look at the relationship between uh, cosine and eta using, uh, so this is kind of like a multi, multivariate regression. Right? So I won't speak too much about the equations, but we can draw diagrams like this. So this is called a pass diagram. I already showed some of them, but in a pass diagram, we represent the observed data in uh, squares and the unobserved or latent variables in circles here. Okay, And we use one-headed diagrams to represent the usual regression relationship uh, also fact the loadings. Uh, the two headed arrows here uh, typically represent the variance or covariance or the correlation between two variables. Okay. Um, also, traditional effect analysis focus on continuous variable. However, now there's a more general, uh, even more general latent variable modeling framework. In this latent variable modeling framework, uh, both observed variables and uh, latent variables can be categorical variables. In this case, we may have like latent class models, uh, we may have mixture models. Um, the observed data can be like also could be kind of data for the Poisson distribution or survival data or, or binary data, for example. Uh, all kinds of data can be used in, uh, now in the SEM framework. Uh, do you have any questions? I'm not sure whether you want to wait to the end, but if you do have questions, feel free to stop me anytime. Okay. Uh, so given like uh, SEM can incorporate many different kinds of variables, right? So now if we have a network, can we incorporate that as a special variable in the network now in the uh, SEM analysis? Uh, for example, if I go back to my past diagram, how about this is a network and this is a network? Right? And then in this case, we don't need any special uh, knowledge about network analysis anymore. Right? We can just conduct regular um, SEM analysis. Uh, so based on that idea, we propose a general framework uh, with networks. For example, this is a a potential network, a friendship network, or any other network. And in this network, uh, we can model it in different ways. For example, uh, we can first treat the network as a outcome variable. So we can use predictors to predict the network, for example, uh, uh, whether uh, two students are friends or not, is related to GPA, related to gender, or is related to personality. We can also uh, use a network as a predictor of some kind of outcome variable. For example, we can use a network to predict happiness, depression, and alcohol use. Right? Uh, maybe like if two students are friends, it's more likely for them to um, to drink alcohol. Right? Uh, it's more like if uh, if you have more friends, uh, it's likely for you to get depressed. Uh, certainly, we can also put the network in the middle. In the middle. Uh, for example, if we see there is a relationship between personality and alcohol use, so does network can explain the relationship? Does network uh, play a mediation role between the relationship of personality and alcohol use? 
So in this case, we can do mediation analysis with the network. And so, for example, to use the network as an outcome, uh, we can use a latent factor space to predict it. Oh, and in this case, the Z here is a uh, factor scores from the factor analysis. Um, we can use network as a predictor, and we can extract the information from network and use that as a predictor to predict an outcome variable Y. I'll talk about this quickly because I will give you some other examples. And then we can use the network as a mediator too. Uh, now I will introduce a few studies we have conducted in this general framework. And in the first study, um, we combine the latent space models with the uh, factor model. And in the latent space model, remember, like uh, we assume we can place individuals in a latent space, right? But we don't really know what uh, the latent space represents. So, which means we don't know, like, uh, what does Z1 and Z2 mean, right? Uh, in order to make it like more uh, interpretable, what we did is we assume we have a factor space. And this factor space uh, can decide the locations of each individual uh, in the network, in the, in the, in the latent space. Uh, then we can use that to decide uh, to predict whether the two students are friends or not or whether two nodes are connected or not, okay? Uh, using that idea, so we still have a logistic regression as in the latent space models. But now notice that we add a part, uh, the distance of the factor based on the factor space, we call it DF. So uh, then the probability for two students to be a friend is related to the uh, factor space, the distance in the factor space. Okay. And how to get this factor space? Uh, this factor space is measured by, uh, uh, by the data we collected. For example, uh, in our study, we collect data on um, personality, big five personality. So this five, this factor could be like personality factors. Okay. Uh, those W would be the 20 items, uh, mini IP IP, right? international personality item, item pool. So, so we have 20 uh, variables to measure the five personality factors. So that's the F, okay. Um, for the latent space, for the, for the distance, we, we simply use the uh, Euclidean distance calculated by this, okay. Uh, this function can be any function. So we look at the two functions. One is a linear function. We assume there's a linear relationship between the distance and the probability for two uh, people to be friends, or the, for the two nodes to be connected. Connected. We also look at the uh, quadratic relationship here. So this is a quadratic function of the distance. Right? So it's a square of the distance here. Uh, in this study, we only consider two factors. Um, also, like uh, we use like a big five like measures scales, but uh, after we fit the model to our data, it turned out the uh, the five factor model didn't fit the data very well, and only those two factors uh, fit the data well. It's maybe because of an issue of translation because we translate the English version of the uh, test to Chinese. Um, anyway, uh, eventually we pick the two factors, the extraversion and the imagination, and each of these factors is measured by four items uh, in our study. So those four items measures, those four items measured extra, extraversion, and those four items measured imagination. And we also found like we need to correlate those the residues of those two variables uh, to have a good fit for this model. So this is eventual 
uh, personality factor model we use to factor model. Uh, using this factor model, we can get the factor scores for the two factors. Uh, then we calculate the distance. Uh, so this is actually the uh, two factor plot. So each individual here represents a student of the 162 students in our study. Okay. Uh, those three students are very close to each other, but those two are uh, very far away uh, from each other in this uh, fact space. And we also can this can see the some covariates. The first covariate is gender, and we need to match uh, the dimension of the covariate with the network. And to do that, we create the uniform homophily effect for gender. So basically, if the two students are of the same gender, we have score equal to one, otherwise they have score equal to zero, which means if both are female students, we have uh, value one. And if both are male students, we also have value one. If one of the male, another is female, zero. So we basically compare, uh, look at all the pairs of students, okay? And using this, we can look at uh, whether students of the same gender are more likely to be friends. Okay. And we also look at the covert academic performance. Uh, for this, we have a continuous variable. So we look at the absolute difference factor effect. So we look at the difference between the GPA of two participants. And in this case, we want to look at uh, if two students that have a similar GP, are they more likely to be friends or not? Yeah. Uh, so we don't really care about whether they have high GP or low GP. We just look at two students where their GP are close. It's possible both of them have, have very high GP or both of them have very low GP. And we also consider the smoking uh, variable. So if both students are if both students smoke, uh, the value is one, otherwise zero. And as well as uh, class membership. And because those 162 students are from different classes, so if they are from the same class, we uh, code it as one, otherwise at zero. And finally, we look at the distance uh, in the fact space. Okay. Uh, so if the distance is uh, smaller, is small, which means uh, the two students have similar personality. Uh, otherwise, they have dissimilar uh, personality. Uh, uh, the overall model, overall model looks like this. So this part is the fact model, right? And then we use a personality to predict this. And then we control some of the effect, gender, GPA, class, and smoke. Okay. And we fit the two models uh, to the data. One model is a linear model. We assume like the, lead, uh, the network is linear related to the personality space. And then another model is a quadratic, quadratic model, okay? And uh, when then we compare the two models, we found the quadratic model uh, fits our data better. So my discussion will then focus on the quadratic model here. Uh, so look at the effects here. Uh, we have the estimates uh, for each of these covariate here. Uh, for the gender is are significant, GP is insignificant uh, based on the confidence interval. Class and smoke uh, are significant, okay? And if it's positive, which means uh, it's more likely to become friends. If it's negative, it's less likely to be friends. And the interpretation of the quadratic relationship uh, is more complex, I'll explain a little bit, a little bit later. Uh, so basically, based on the results we found, uh, students of the same gender are more likely to be friends. So, which means uh, 
Uh, if both students are female and male, they are more likely to be friends. Certainly, it's uh, very intuitive. Uh, if students have the similar uh, GPA, um, is but this one is not significant. However, it is uh, negative, which means if they have a similar GPA, uh, it's less likely for them to be friends. Okay, but it's insignificant, which means it's no different from zero. Uh, if students are from the same class, they are more likely to be friends. So this also uh, makes sense. Uh, if two students both smoke, it's more likely to, for them to be friends. Okay. And we also found the quadratic relationship between uh, similar personality and the friendship. Uh, but I want to point out here is we didn't look at the causal relationship here. So all those relationships are correlational relationship. Okay, uh, it's certainly it's very possible. Like um, uh, if two students are friends, it's more likely for them to uh, smoke both, right? For both of them to to smoke. Uh, then how to interpret the relation, the quadratic relationship? We found this very interesting. Uh, so this is the plot of the quadratic uh, function from our results. So we found like. Uh, like uh, uh, if two students are very similar in terms of personality, then they are very likely to be friends. Okay, so this uh, y-axis is the uh, probability of being friends for two students. Okay, so uh, this x-axis is the distance of the personality. So therefore, here smaller value, which means uh, the distance is very small, so which means they have very similar personality. So it's very likely for them, it's more likely for them to be friends. And on the other hand, uh, if we look at here, here means the distance is large, which means they have very different personality. And in this case, they are also more likely to be friends. Uh, somewhere in the middle when the distance is about 2.145, there's low, lowest probability uh, for the student, for, for two students, to be friends. So basically, this tells us like uh, uh, if either uh, you are very similar, you you will become friends, or you are very different, you will become friends. Right? And in the literature of personality, in the past, uh, people have found like uh, uh, different conclusion. Some people found like uh, uh, similar personality uh, leads to like uh, one friends. It's called the birds of feathers flock together. And there's also study who found like opposites attract. So which means uh, if people are very different, they attract each other. Right? But from this study, it's very clear the the there's actually a nonlinear relationship. Right? So therefore, it is the the both like both phenomena can coexist in one like uh, in in one study. So in a second study, we investigate the potential uh, mediation role uh, of another work. So this method is a direct uh, um, extension of latent space model. Uh, what we did here is uh, we extract the network information using the lat uh, the latent space model. Uh, notice that here Z Z G represents the latent positions uh, in the latent space, right? Uh, so. This method can be used either as a data redu reduction method. So because in our network, we have 162 times 162 uh, matrix. Right? So we cannot use each individual person in our uh, median model. Otherwise, uh, we have more variables than participants. So we cannot estimate the model. 
Uh, therefore, we extract the information of the network using the latent space Z. Okay, and in this situation, we don't really care about what Z is. It just represents the information uh, in the network. And then we use those Z as potential uh, mediators. For example, uh, we have a predictor X here, and then we have an outcome variable Y here. So X predict Y. And then we have a multiple Z here. This, the, the Z, how many Z here depends on the dimension of the latent space. For example, if you decide to have a two-dimensional latent space, uh, you have two Zs. And if you have three-dimensional latent space, you have three Zs. And uh, there are some ways to determine how many uh, dimensions we want to use in a latent space model. For example, we can uh, decide that based on BIC or AIC. Uh, the words right, we have- uh, Sorry, uh, Johnny? Yes. This is a, this is a hand up and uh, sorry, uh, Tanya has been patiently waiting. I, I did not notice that. Uh, Tanya, can, can you go ahead and ask a question? Is this uh, too late or you can ask later? No, 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 it's good. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Oh, Dr. Zhang, I, I do apologize for interrupting you. I just have, I, I, I didn't catch up your, uh, for the last uh, study, when you mentioned mm -hmm. the spot, uh, if you don't mind, uh, went back to, uh, go back to the, uh, the, 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 yeah, a couple. This month? Uh, uh, before this. Like five slides. <laughs> right, this one. Mm -hmm. No, the one with the chart. I mean, with the plot. Uh, you mean yes, the, 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 the plot. This no, one? Uh, not, uh, another one. There we go, yes. Okay, okay Dr. Zhang. So I am a little bit confused. Um, I, I'm trying to, you know, you know, uh, understand this based on my existing knowledge. How, how does this um, different? Uh, how is this different from the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, class analysis? Uh, you mean cluster analysis, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, yes. Class cluster analysis is the. Uh, it's uh, like a kind of like a non-parametric method. Right? Mm -hmm. So here is more like a, a parametric method. Uh, certainly, you can also use class analysis, class analysis to group your participants into different like groups. But here we actually estimate like an individual score for each person. So we are not like a grouping uh, people here. I, but you I mean, could, the, you the, could, the you circle could, you you had there I make me think about the the seeds in the you know class analysis. So yes. That's why I asked this. Yeah, you could use the factor scores to do like a further to uh, further conduct the class analysis and then divide them into different clusters. Sure. Thank you. And for your study too, you mentioned the you know the the the, the dimension reduction, right? That's mm -hmm. more sounds like a cluster analysis. Like it's a reduction. Uh, 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 is it uh, no, uh, uh, right? So it? you may think about this more about like a principal component. Oh, I, I will. I will let you continue. Sorry. <laughs> it depends on like the purpose. Um, because in my understanding, the cluster analysis will uh, decide the group membership. Right? Like the individuals, mm -hmm. based on uh, multiple, like uh, observe multiple variables. Yeah. Um. So this in this uh, model, we treat the latent space or the uh, latent variables in the latent space as mediator. Um, the also the idea is very like straightforward. There's only one issue here. Uh, notice that when we have multiple mediators, when we have multiple mediation effects, right? So the mediation effect through Z1 is A1 times B1, through Z2 is A2 times B2, okay? Um, the issue with the, with the individual mediation effect is 
because in the latent space, notice that in the latent space, we can uh, rotate the latent space. If you are familiar with factor analysis, you can rotate the uh, rotate the factors. After you do the factor rotation, uh, the scores of the factors would be would change. So therefore, the score of Z and Z here will be different after the rotation, right? But does not change your model fit. It fit your model. It, it does not fit change your model fit. It will still fit your data equally well. So in this case, um, the individual mediation effect is not determined and it can be changed. However, we can still show if you look at the overall mediation effect, if you look at A1 plus A1 times A2, B1 plus A2 times B2 plus AD times BD, so the overall mediation effect uh, will be invariant no matter whether you rotate your latent space or not. So therefore, uh, in this mediation analysis, we should focus on the total mediation effect here instead of individual mediation effect here. So that basically means, okay, uh, the overall effect of a network. Okay. Uh, for example, we, uh, we have found like the difference uh, in smoking uh, for male and female participants. There's a gender effect here. And we want to know whether a network can explain this gender effect. So our hypothesis would be like, uh, uh, if both are male or female, they are more likely to be friends. So if uh, they are friends, uh, they are more likely to smoke. Uh, uh, kind of like both of them are more likely to smoke. Okay. So based on that, we estimate our model and we found like the estimated direct effect is uh, about negative one and is significant. So which means if I go back here, so this path is significant, okay? And then we have estimated the mediation effect. The total mediation effect uh, is also significant. What is total mediation effect? The total mediation effect is the indirect effect through this network to here. And it's also significant. Okay, uh, so this basically indicator uh, the media, the 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 network can actually explain uh, some of the some of the effect from gender to smoke. Okay, so overall, this is called a partial mediation, a partial mediation effect. Uh, certainly, we can. Conduct like uh, more ana analysis here. Okay. Um, we also develop some other methods to extract the data. Um, for example, uh, another way we use the eigen decomposition to extract the information from the uh, network instead of using latent space models. Right? Um, uh, as uh, as the question suggested earlier, you could also use in like uh, a class analysis. You do a class analysis to group those participants first, and uh, then use the cluster information uh, as a potential mediator uh, in the mediation model. That's also possible. Uh, the previous model is the uh, cross section model. Right? Uh, uh, in a third model, we also look at the longitudinal network mediation model. And um, the longitudinal network meeting model, we may have data collected from different waves, uh, from different time. So this is the protein predictor X, uh, protein outcome Y. And then we can have networks. Network can be a mediator like in between. So the data, the X at the time one would cause change in the network. For example, X may cause whether two students uh, become friends or not. Right? And after they become friends, maybe like they are more likely to do something similar. And so that's the outcome of every one. So there is a uh, lag the effect here. Okay. Um, we apply this model to a different data set. So the, the study is called the Teenager um, Friends and Lifestyle Study. 
So the we didn't collect the data. The data is uh, free, freely available online. Uh, the purpose of the R, the R purpose of the study is to investigate the, uh, the change toward change of attitudes towards smoking and smoking behavior. Um, this data has as uh, 129 students. Uh, uh, different from our data collecting, uh, the friendship network here is formed using another very wide method for data collection. So basically, uh, each student in this study uh, was asked to name up to six friends. So for example, I asked you give uh, six names uh, of your friends. Right? Um, it turns out like, uh, only 13 of those 129 students named a maximum of six students. And most, most of them only named three students. And the average is about 3.5 students. So that basically means using this method, we actually capture like, uh, uh, this method can actually capture a lot of like a friendship relationship among this group of participants, right? And on the other hand, if uh, if most of them name six friends, which means uh, the study would miss a lot of information. Right? And in the study, like two means uh, uh, best friends, one means just a friend, zero means no friend. And again, in our study, uh, we combine two and one as friend, and zero as not friend. Uh, the data collected was three times. So this is a, a network plot at each time, from time one, time two, time three. And from here, we noticed that uh, over time, there, there were more connections like among the students. For example, um, at the first time, um, this group of students are separated from the rest. Um, but during the second wave of the data collection, there is some connection this here. And there are more connections at uh, the uh, time three. And in this plot, we put like the uh, same students at the same location. Okay. We just look at how uh, the connection changes over time. Uh, uh, this model is a topic of, uh, of the dissertation of one of my students. Um, so we built the model based on the ERGM instead of the uh, latent space model. And in the uh, ERGM, um, we actually kind of construct uh, the, the network covariates using the method I talked about. I talked about in the in our first study. So, for example, we can construct the homophily effect for the uh, predictor as well as other kind. Okay. So, how did uh, and in this study we actually look at the relation among three variables. We did the other research, but I only um, give you an example here. So we want to look at the whether the friendship network uh, is a mediator between spotting activity and smoking. Uh, spotting, spotting activity basically represents like uh, uh, whether students play sports, whether they went uh, to like uh, the uh, sport games, su such activities. Okay. And we look at the absolute difference of spotting activities. And from that, we can construct the uh, uh, matrix look like this. Right? Um, so this is the difference in terms of uh, the sports activity uh, between uh, student one and student two, and between student one and student three. So then we get a um, uh, data matrix look like this. And this data matrix will have the same dimension as the network uh, matrix. Okay. And for the outcome variable, the smoking behavior, we use a uni uniform homophily effect. 
So if both of them smoke, we have one, otherwise we have zero. So if, which means if one smoke, one does not smoke. Uh, then we put the, the information into a mediation model uh, in a longitudinal meeting model. And this is the past diagram uh, of our model. Okay. And you will notice that, like in fitting the model, we set those, it's called the autoregressive parameters. We set the autoregressive parameter to be the same. Okay. We also set the uh, passes, some of the passes to be the same. So this is the uh, typical uh, assumption in cross like mediation model or longitudinal mediation model. Okay. Uh, those are the parameter estimates uh, from the model, uh, as well as the, we also use the bootstrap to get the confidence intervals uh, for for each parameter. So the first row is the estimate, uh, A, B, C, and A times B. A times B is the mediation effect. It's negative point, about negative point 0.1, okay. Um, uh, the MRE confidence interval and uh, the bootstrap confidence interval. Bootstrap, bootstrap confidence may work better here uh, in our situation. So we actually draw the conclusion based on the bootstrap confidence interval. Uh, it is, uh, does not include zero, which means we have a significant mediation effect here. Okay, and C is the direct effect. And C is actually insignificant here. Uh, therefore, we actually have a complete, complete mediation, which means uh, if you look at the coefficient from this to here, this path is actually zero. Okay, um, but A times B here is significant. We also see both A and B are significant too, okay. Uh, then how to interpret the results? So this means like uh, uh, the, re the reason like the sports activity is related to um, smoking, that's because of the friendship network, because of friendship relationship, okay. So which means we can use whether two students are friends or not to completely explain why there is a, a relationship between sport, sports, sporting activity and smoking, okay? Because previously we found like uh, uh, if two students have a similar amount of sporting activity, uh, then the, the two students are more likely to smoke. And why is that the case? Because if you go to sports, like sports events uh, together all the time, it's more likely you will become friends. Right? And then because of that, it's more likely for uh, both students to smoke. And we also found that A is negative and B is positive. Negative means like, uh, uh, if there's more difference like in sports activities, uh, then it's less likely for them to be friends. For example, uh, if one uh, student enjoy like sports, another doesn't, so it's very less likely, it's less likely for them to be friends, okay. Uh, this B is positive. B is positive, which means uh, if two students are friends, uh, it's more likely for them for them to smoke or not to smoke. Um, so we all, we, at, at the beginning I already showed you like that a network may have a very different data structure uh, from the non-network data. Right? In a network we have a square matrix and this square matrix represents the uh, relationship among uh, uh, any pair of participants in your data set. And to be able to model the network data together with the non-network data, uh, we have to either we can extract the information from the network, 
right? so that the, uh, we reduce the definition of the network data. Or we can expand the non-network data to have the same dimension as our network data. Uh, in study two, we basically extract the information from a network and then use that information uh, further in a mitigation model. Right? But in study three, we actually expanded the non-network data to match the dimension of the network data. Uh, study one can be viewed as a combination of both. Yeah. Um, so, in all those three studies, we kind of treat the network as a special variable. Um, it's a special variable in a SEM model. Uh, this can be a predictor, can be a mediator, can also be an outcome. Uh, so, by doing so, we have a more free, more flexible, like a master to analyze network data and non-network data together. Hi, Johnny. Uh, some students yes. ask, uh, oh, sorry, some students ask, can you, can you show the data set again? I think uh, um, you showed earlier, and uh, some ask uh, to, to take a look at it and understand better. I think you, you demonstrated in one of the slides. Can you go back and uh, look at the data set? Which one? Which data set? First data set or second data set? Julie, would like to, uh, I think that there's a data set with the, uh, I think you can show the um, the one with the rows and uh, the first oh, okay. part with the matrix and the other one is the, uh, uh, those attributes. Okay. So that is how you get started with this. Yeah, log. Oh, on. yeah, this is one of them, and uh, so yeah. this is this this is the data set, yeah. And as mm -hmm. I said, like uh, it's very difficult to model them directly. The reason is, for example, if you want to predict the smoke here, if we include all of those columns as predictors, then we cannot identify the model, and right? we have more variables uh, than the data. So one way to fix it is. We reduce the dimension here. We, for example, we have six. We can reduce to a dimension one or two. Mm -hmm. We extract the two mm -hmm. columns of information, and then we can mm -hmm. predict the outcome variable. And another way to do that is, uh, so this is a six by six matrix. So we can define general matrix. So uh, we can see like if we look at all those six var six participants, uh, if they are both male. And then we get the score one. And if mm -hmm. one, of them, one of them is male, another is female, we get the score zero. So in this case, we can also construct a six by six matrix. And in this six by six matrix, we only have zero and one. One means the two students are either both male or female. Zero means one of them is male, another is female. And in this case, we match the data together and then we can uh, model it. So that's the method we use in our study three uh, to look at the relationship between network and the uh, and the smoking. Okay, okay. Yeah. So then you suggest that 162 times 162 that means that uh, yeah that is uh, the number of uh, uh, the n times n yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, participants, yeah. Yeah. So we would in, have- in International relations, this is called dyadic data. Yeah. Dyadic, yeah, if, yeah. If, if you only look at a pair of people, you have dyadic the data. Pairs. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually the generalization of the dyadic uh, data, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I cannot see the question, so did I answer the question? What do you, what do you mean yeah. by ellipsis? I, I, I would just read, Dr. Ho. Oh, Dr. Zhang, I really like your study. I think they're very interesting, especially the first one. I was listen to it, and I would suggest that if you could put the uh, ellipsis, which is three dot, uh, 
right? That mm-hmm. that would make more sense. That make it like a uh, one hundred sixty two yeah. by one hundred sixty two. I was a little bit confused oh, when I oh. initially oh, saw I this. See. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, but that, that's good. I mean, it doesn't six, yeah. Six participants. No. Ex- yeah. Right. That okay. will make more sense. Yeah. Right. I should but you did again. great. Yeah. Thank wow. you. That that make perfect sense. I have a follow up question on the uh, study yeah. number two. I was mm-hmm. so I feel so bad to you know uh, in, interrupt you. So which, which oh, I which didn't. Oh no problem at all. But yeah. uh, so for the you did mention the uh, the rotation the factor analysis, mm-hmm. which I uh, I happen to read some um, a research article that talks about the method. Um, one researcher argued that. Uh, they, you know, some of the people in in in, in the social science. Oh, I'm I'm in the public administ- administration, um, you know, uh, area. Uh, I'm a mm-hmm. third year PhD student um, with Dr. Ho. I'm taking mm-hmm. his class, SEM class this semester. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, speaking of the the factor analysis, uh, this researcher argued that they the default was orthogonal, uh, you know, rotation. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. the very very max. This is mm-hmm. you know golden rule kind of but the rationale behind this was uh you know um, back to the age that you know they uh, this method was invented um you know 20th century i don't know and you know when the computer was not even you know exist so that people have to manually calculate that that of course if we have the you know orthogonal rotation then you know it's just you know little uh, calculation Compare with the you know the uh, oblique uh, uh, rotation, which will uh, mm-hmm. you know allow the factors to uh, correlate it. Mm-hmm. What is your comment or uh, opinion on this? So, as a young you know a junior re- uh, scholar, uh, what your method should we uh, take into consideration? And thank you. Uh, and why? Thank I, you. I would say like it depends. So, um, in our like uh, in the latent space models, right? Basically, it's all assume like um, all the like uh, uh, latent factors are orthogonal, so they are not correlated. So in this case, those are orthogonal like uh, uh, factors. Uh, I mean, like uh, certainly, you know, like in reality, everything should be correlated, right? So if you want to do a fact, uh, factor rotation, uh, so oblique. Like a rotation certainly probably is better because you you do hope that, but from like a data analysis point point, uh, if you have correlated factors, like you you may have issues like in the future. For example, if you put your factors into a regression analysis, there might be like collinearity problem. And right? um, I mean, it depends. Like uh, in general, like probably you you. I, I don't think a lot of people use orthogonal rotation anymore, um, because like uh, uh, if you allow your factors to be correlated in general, your model would fit your data better. Right? And if you use like uh, uncorrelated factors, it's very likely uh, your model won't fit your data. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. I think that you answered my question. Well, I have a concern about this because uh, I saw many of the uh, publications in, in my field, I, I bet the researchers won't necessarily understand the you know uh, at throughout that you you do you know they don't really understand the you know the why they choose this method. But you some know, of them, some of them they they just run both and you know explain why they chose uh, you know either mm-hmm. or. That would make mm-hmm. more sense to me. If mm-hmm. they, you you know different. like it's not necessarily incorrect to use that or not necessarily wrong to do it, mm-hmm. um, because. Uh, in when you design like a scale, right? You, and typically you hope like uh, um, your factors are actually are uncorrelated, so you have a uh, discrimination. And uh, so in that case, for example, um, if I want to measure like a hairs, right? So those variables should measure hairs only. It shouldn't measure like uh, cognitive ability, right? So you don't want to do that, right? So that's why, like a lot of people, hope like their factors are actually correct. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I think you you make a good point that you don't you don't want to have some you know multicollinearity issues later on. Then yeah. you know, right. Thank you so much.
All right. How about we proceed to the, to the last, uh, last few slides uh, before we do more Q and A's? Johnny, how about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, don't have have a I don't have a couple of slides left here. Yeah. Okay, please. Yeah. Now, yeah. So, uh, for future directions, we have uh, many things can be like done for the three study I just discussed. For example, uh, for the study one, we actually only use the factor space. We didn't consider like a network latency, network latency, network latency space anymore. And you may think about this, like uh, the fact that space may not uh, necessarily explain all the information in the network, right? Like in regression analysis, we have predicted we have residuals, right? Uh, we can include the latent space. Latent space can be viewed as like residuals. So which means we have something that can uh, uh, errors in into the fact that space. So it's a combination both fact space and latent space. And uh, in study two and study three, uh, I didn't use any covariance. Right? And certainly we can have covariance in our we have covariance in our study. Uh, the covariance mm -hmm. may lead to the uh, mediator and the outcome variable, and even the predictor. And we should consider we can also consider like uh, uh, those covariance in the models. And uh, for study three, I said like we kind of expand our um, uh, covariance uh, curves that is also called the network attributes. Yeah. So, so another way to do it is we can extract the information from the network, and then we use the latent space model uh, as more like in study one uh, to more like in study two to redo the media analysis. Uh, particularly uh, in the future, uh, what we plan to do is we can uh, also expand our studies for the weighted network. And here I only look at uh, like a binary network, it's unweighted, it's a zero and a one, right? But in our data collecting, we have left scales, one to five. So those are called like weighted network. We can derive the models of weighted network. And uh, also in our current analysis, uh, we look at the indirect relationship, which means uh, we simply assume like uh, uh, the two students are either friends or not. If one student views the other one as a friend, so the other students also view the these students as a friend. But in our data collection, we actually found like uh, uh, one student may view another student as a friend, but the other student may not view that student as a friend. So in this case, we have a directed network. So we can also um, um, expand our study to uh, model the directed networks. And we can also look at some of the complex networks, or the multivariate networks, uh, using our like uh, SEM language. Uh, for example, uh, for the friendship relationship, we may have different networks. And particularly for in our study, we collect the self-report uh, friendship relationship. They ask whether they are friends or not. We actually have another network I didn't talk about. Uh, we actually also look at whether they are which other friends or not. So basically, we have two networks, uh, but they are measured in the same thing. It's more like in a fact analysis, we may have three uh, different observed variables, but we only have one factor. Similarly, we can construct a network factor from the two observed networks. And then we do our data analysis. And we are also working on like a develop or a package to carry out this kind of data analysis. So in the future, we hope like uh, uh, you can do this analysis very easily. You just tell like, okay, I want the X predict M and M predict Y. And then just tell M is a network then we can do all those like analysis for you automatically. So you don't need to uh, uh, really like worry about how to estimate the model, how to construct um, those different matrix, uh, how to extract the information from the network. So we'll do this uh, for you in the network. And we also develop some online app, so you can do this online. 
And we have a lot of, we will put the information on our um, project website here. So, so you can come back in the future, uh, most likely next year sometime, middle of the next year, and we'll put some information here. And finally, I want to thank my students, and Chang, Haiyan, Wen, and all three of them have worked on the project uh, I presented here. And I also want to thank my colleagues, Yi Kong Jin, and Li Yuan, and Ki Yuan, and Nong Din. So they also have a lot of those projects. And some of the research is funded by uh, IES. Okay, now do you have any questions? Wow, it's just a lot of uh, materials. <laughs> Johnny, I think you packed three, three talks into one, and uh, no, no wonder you take uh, no, I need 20, uh, sorry, 90, almost 100 minutes now. <laughs> oh, okay, now, uh, to now this, this is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to show you what we have done here, particularly yes. uh, if you are interested in this, and we have our data set. I can, I'll be very happy to share the data set with you so you can explore to see if you can like, answer some other questions. Okay. All right. Uh, we welcome any questions from the Taiwan side and the US side. Now, this time, can we uh, let's uh, have the Taiwan side post question first? I think every time we often, we at uh, US side, we take, take Take the first, uh, the, uh, the, yeah. We want to be uh, let. We want to let the Taiwan uh, uh, students and colleagues to pose the question first this time. Thank you, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Zhang, and this is wonderful and, and you know, um, very inspiring, inspiring. And we can think of many. Um, we try to think of this this context and setting that we can apply this um, methods to. And here's a question about your presentation. Mm -hmm. It's about a longitudinal model. Uh, did you ask um, the question? Uh, here the question goes. Did you ask whether the subjects change from non-smoker at time one to smoker and uh, at time two? You know, you know oh. what the question is about. So, so there will be a stronger argument about the effects of a network on smoking, right? Because mm -hmm. we have the three different time, uh, mm -hmm. the wave. Mm -hmm. For example, one student and he is not a smoker at time one, and then eventually become a smoker. So then we can argue that the network effects, uh, that that's the sum sum of network effects, you know. Yes. Otherwise, we can we can do it otherwise. I argue, argue uh, otherwise. Say uh, I make friends because I smoke, so mm -hmm. I make friends with some smokers' friends. Mm -hmm. All right. So that that's the X and mm -hmm. one stuff. So um, I wonder if you have the chance to ask the questions of whether you are a smoker at this time, and mm -hmm. then second wave, third wave. If there's a change, maybe there will be a stronger argument about this effects. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question and comment. Um, I didn't collect the data, but during their data collection, they actually asked whether they smoke or not at each time. So, so we can find the information like maybe like uh, uh, at the first time a student smoke, smoked like, uh, but at the same time, uh, he or she st stopped smoking, right? And then at the third time, uh, he or she uh, started to smoke again, right? So this kind of information is actually available. Um, that's also like the reason like uh, uh, we use the longitudinal model here because longitudinal model can help us see like the changes through time. Uh, like the first study, we only have data from uh, one time. And uh, so that's a static like uh, relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this actually already take into consideration of the change uh, in the smoking status in this model. All right. Yeah, yeah. That that, that makes perfect sense. And and a related question is about: um, Did you ever compare the the effect? I mean, the longitudinal model with a any of the uh, cross-sectional model? For example, that I, I think that the theory theoretically, yeah, it makes sense. You know, uh, because of this. Yeah. Yeah. 
longitudinal effect mm. with just any one wave of the cross sectional. For example, mm. usually, um, I think this is very, very, very interesting and very inspiring too. Yes, I, I, I totally agree. But uh, if we do not do a longitudinal data, and I just <laughs> collect one wave of data, and mm -hmm. do the relationship or like correlation, covariate, or whatever, and then you compare the models. Uh, did you ever have the chance to do that? Uh, that's that, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I didn't look at the 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 relation cross-sectionally because, as you suggested, we we can actually look at the relationship at each time and see if we, uh, the results are consistent or not, right? And we. We did another analysis actually. Um, so we look at the spots at the time time one, and then directly predict the smoke at the time two. So that's another potential like uh, longitudinal model. We did look at that. So the the results are similar, but then we found like the uh, we found we found we found the the significant direct effect, for example, sorry, we found the effect from wave one spot to uh, wave two uh, smoking. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure, you know, like uh, because I didn't, I didn't do the data analysis, so I'm not sure whether I will find the same results or not. Mm. Just curious. But, yeah, just curious. Yeah. Mm. That, your model, I think it makes sense to me. And I'm just curious if we, we do a comparison between you know, the cross-sectional one or and uh, versus mm -hmm. um, the longitudinal one. Uh, what 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 would that be? And then just a key, yeah, so yeah. I'm just curious. That actually can suggest some more useful information. For example, it may suggest may suggest like uh, uh, the longitudinal model actually more useful than cross-sectional model. Yes. If we can see like the difference. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. That's very. Very good, like comment and suggestion. All right, and, and just a minor question about this one is: um, Could you explain a little bit about the um, comparing, comparing the fit of the linear model versus the quadratic models? Because mm -hmm, um, sure. there's a, a number, right? Uh, the statics, mm -hmm. like at one, yeah. uh, um, ten thousand so, something versus nine thousand something. Mm -hmm. So we estimated the model using the yeah, Bayesian method. And in the Bayesian method, we, we can calculate something called the Devens information criterion. So this is very similar to ESC and BSC. But the yeah, see, yeah. is more widely used in, in Bayesian. And mm -hmm. the smaller DSC means a better model. So we only compare those two models. And now I think we should also fit like maybe a cubic model and other polynomial models to make sure like this model also works better than a cubic model. But here we only look at the two models. Initially, we only look at the linear model, actually. So we published that. And later on, uh, we got some suggestions about like a potential like nonlinear model. The reason is because in the literature, people have found the insignificant results, in inconsistent results. For example, they found both of those conclusions. And then we saw that maybe it's because there is a nonlinear relationship. So we fit as a quadratic model. And it turns out, it turned out that actually there's a nonlinear relationship here. This model works um, better than the, uh, the, than the linear model. Yeah, this, this one's very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, I'm going to turn the microphone to Carl. Uh, what about US side? Any questions? Yeah, any 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 questions uh, from the US side? Maybe I can start first. <laughs> so actually, you can do it like from a machine learning uh, perspective mm -hmm. and try to and um, of course you don't do it compared to or you can actually come uh, do a number of functional forms. So. Uh, yeah. but of course, the machine learning is looking at the prediction, which one predicts better. And mm -hmm. uh, so we are not uh, explaining yet, just uh, look at the prediction. There, there are a, a number of algorithms you can use, and, uh, and also the functional forms you can use the combined 
those mm -hmm. to, to see if that they were better. But uh, the hard part is, but in his upper is, is, is not giving much in uh, enjoying inference, like uh, a strong inference, like in your models. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, this is just a suggestion. I think I have a hand here and uh, in the audience. And let me see. And my, my computer is slow. Let's see. Um, let me see if the, this computer is better. And I have multiple computers. And yeah. uh, Tim has a hand up. And I think there is another hand up. Uh, uh, if it's OK, Tim, let me have uh, Cooper. Uh, uh, Glenn, ask a question first, then, then, then followed by you. How about that? Glenn, please go ahead. Glenn? Yes. Hi. Th hey. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. It was it was very fascinating. Um, lately, I've been thinking about um, you know all the dark data that exists mm -hmm. within um, corporate entities. The mm -hmm. you know for example all the email mm -hmm. correspondence that you know, goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking your friendship kind of analysis might be applied to emails mm -hmm. yeah and you know in the yeah. to and the from mm -hmm. could be you know friends you know a, a friend attachment i'm just wondering if if you're aware of any any, any examples of anyone that's doing mm -hmm. analysis like that yes yes actually there are a lot of uh, like uh, studies um, using network to study like the uh, communications through emails or through other ways. Um, I think there's a data set. What's what can I, I can't remember the name. So that's about the company. So there's a uh, all the email information outside there. So you can see like who sent whom like emails and who replied to who. Um, so they just look at the, uh, but like uh, in typical network analysis, they just want to look at like the uh, structures within that network itself. For example, identify like most popular people like uh, uh, in the uh, in a group. For example, who is the key person uh, like in the communication? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but less about like the. The combination of like uh, um, the network and the other like attributes. For example, uh, what caused one like reply like to another people like uh, more quickly or or slowly something like that. I think that might be more interesting to me, but I didn't see much study on that. Yeah, but using network analysis to study like its communications, like in emails, is actually. Um, it's actually very common. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question, Glenn. Uh, can you please? Thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, Dr. Zhang, I, I appreciate for your presentation. It's a great one, and I'm excited about it. And I have a, a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. One is related to your data. I'm curious, just out of my curiosity, did you have any um, issue uh, or concern with IRB? We will have some, you know, human subject. Uh, you know, if the study was conducting, you know, with Chinese uh, particip particip participants, uh, like survey takers or the interviews. No, we actually got IRB approved for data collection. Oh, you still have to go through that process. Yeah, yeah, we procedure, have to go right? through the even if it's, a, it's the RC. Yeah, we have got the IRB approved uh, for data collection and. The the you know like uh, we have we actually have three waves of data collection. For the first wave is like uh, paper and pencil. Uh, the quality of the data is very good actually. So we are we are very <laughs> data. And the sec for the second wave is a follow up. So we did like online data collection, and then the quality of the data is like <laughs> it's not good at all. Um, but it's, it's we 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 look at the data. It's very clear. Like uh, uh, some students didn't answer those questions honestly, and then we have the third wave of the data collection, and then that 
quality is really bad. <laughs> so we are now actually trying to figure out uh, like um, ways to identify like uh, which students' response is in high quality, and then we can use that part of the information. <laughs> we did a study actually, so we haven't finished it yet. And we look forward to it. Yeah. I'm not surprised actually. Well, I got my uh, bachelor degree in China. Uh, I know, you know, their uh -huh. the respondents can be treat, you know, savvy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. You, know. you know, we we spend a lot of money on data collection. Like uh, for the third wave of data collection, we pay like um, uh, 100 yuan to each student. But just because of that, it caused a lot of problem. Because like. Uh, <laughs> Then some students just jump in. They were not in the first and the second wave of the data collection. So they just pretend they are. <laughs> they, they, they were participating. <laughs> so because of that, like, uh, so it's make the data like unusable, you know. So there's always <laughs> lessons there. Well, thank you for sharing this. I mean, it's such a pain. I, I apologize if that yes, triggers your bad memory. Yeah, actually, very, very difficult. You know, so I'm a quantitative psychologist. And I I always say like, uh, I don't need to collect data. <laughs> I can always use other data. So this is the first time I'm collecting my own data. So uh, I learned my lesson, and it's, it's hard. It's actually very hard. Well, this yeah. actually lead to my second question. That well, I, you're not alone. I'm I have some. Uh, I'm doing some uh, philanthropy uh, study. Um, you know, on a, mm -hmm. a Chinese nonprofit. Uh, for a couple of papers, and one is for Dr. Ho's class, which I had, yeah. you know, a big trouble with data too. But uh, so speaking of the structural equation model, which is one of your major topics for today. Mm -hmm. So as you know, uh, junior scholars, uh, how, how can we view this, you know, structural equation model? Uh, my main takeaway from Dr. Ho's class was, um, say, I the the structural equation model was a a framework that I can, uh, a, you know, it has the flexibility or, ca uh, you know, ca capacity for me to build on my uh, multiple hypotheses into mm -hmm. the same model so that I can, uh, later on, I can test this for my dissertation, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. it, 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 is that right? Or uh, do you have any comments on? Yes, on certainly, it's certainly right. All Carl said <laughs> is right. <laughs> so, oh, so <laughs> Oh, I, I'm grateful. I mean, I really learned a lot from the, uh, the yeah. master. Yeah, uh, I think SEM is now very popular, like in in many different areas: is it, is it? psychology, sociology, finance, management. And uh, there's a reason for that. The reason is because it's a very uh, flexible model and a flexible. I would say this framework is a very flexible framework. We call the latent variable mm -hmm. modeling. Yeah, so you can. Um, because in social science, and oftentimes we want to build some theory. Uh, it's not unlike in in finance, for example. Maybe like you are more interested in prediction. In prediction, you want to predicting mm -hmm. whether stock will yeah. like uh, rise or or not. So so that is, that is actually easy because you don't need to care about your model. Like Carl said, you can use a lot of machine learning method, right? You can uh, get a very good like a uh, 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 prediction accuracy, right? But now these mm -hmm. matters for for social science, for example, for psychology, yeah. for psychologists, oftentimes we want to find some some way to do intervention, right? We want to change yeah, people's yeah, behavior, yeah. right? Uh, if you can only predict that, you can predict the behavior very well. It's not useful because I cannot change that. But if I can find uh, like a variable. That is closely related to that behavior, and then you can change it. And for example, in psychology, we always want to, like, uh, uh, in increase like people's cognition, so they can, like, when people mm -hmm. even people become older, they can live very well, right? Uh, so in this case, we can find ways to improve people's cognition. For example, do a lot of training. Uh, those training intervention is actually based on theory, right? So therefore, we want to build a theory. Uh, using SEM, you can actually build some kind of theory. For example, build this theory. Like, uh, for example, uh, 
half of the, like uh, half, half the parents like got their degrees, probably it's very difficult to mm. to to give them more to have them have more education anymore, right? You cannot let let them go back to like college to study more. Probably it's not easy. But if we found like home environment actually is the key here, right? The reason is not just because of the mother education, it's because we can provide a better home environment, right? Uh, there are many other ways to provide a like, better home environment. Uh, then we can actually um, conduct the intervention on here. In this case, we can help children to learn better of mathematics, right? So this is what we can find using SEM. I think it's very coincidental, and um, because uh, yesterday uh, one of my classmates is presenting for uh, her, uh, you know, class uh, on Dr. Ho's class, and they she find out they um, father's education has no uh, contribution to the their score or whatever math score or whatever, and but you you're saying the the mother's education <laughs> does have a in, in, in fact to the, uh, the score, but with the mediation, uh, you know, the, the home. Home education, uh, no home uh, environment. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I just have a quick question, um, if you don't mind. It's a specific question. Uh, when mm -hmm. you were linking the life of the par life of the party and the vivid uh, imagination, um, why did you do that, or what, what's the rationale behind? It, 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 uh, it seems to me that it's uh, it seems very subjective if you don't have any theoretical. Uh, you know, ground to support that. Could you elaborate? There, a bit, there, please? there is actually a, a theory on the that that's called the Big Five Personality Theory. Right. So this is very well studied in psychology. We have found like uh, typical like a five personality, um, like uh, dimensions. There's also like other theories about like uh, more like uh, dimensions. Uh, so when we collect the data, we use twenty items. We actually know. Those five items, those four items are related to this extroversion like factor, mm -hmm. and those four related to imagination. Mm -hmm. So we have four, five factors. Mm -hmm. Here, so those five factors. So each uh, has five like measures. Five, each has four measures. So we use four variables to measure each of those uh, one of the five factors. So there's a like a strong theory uh, behind that. So I, I was actually surprised that we didn't find all uh, five factors in the data analysis. So it's very clear uh, this factor and this factor uh, fitted our data very well, but the other three not so. Oh, that's a very standard, uh, very standard measurement, like yeah. developed mm -hmm. by some uh, scholars. Uh, yeah. Based on mm -hmm. a, five. it seems like a one to five liquor scale, right? Yeah. So, it's... oh, that's a standard. Uh, I see. I got you. And oh, so I, I I get it. You know, they some of the you know construct they 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 you allow them to correlate. But I I was I was asking about the the indicators on in your um, diagram. Uh, Right, this one. Right, yeah. the, I am a life, I am the life of the party, and I have a vivid imagination. Yeah. Um, I was uh, asking, why did you, what, what's the rationale for you to, you know, uh, correlate and this? Uh, I actually cheated here, you know. <laughs> Supposedly, there shouldn't be such okay, a model fit. The, the uh -huh. You just here. want the model fit better, right? Because the model didn't fit very well. And once we put this, there's a, Huge improvement in terms of model fit. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. No offense. I mean, All right. see, I learned from Doctor Ho's class. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think the model modification. Move to Taiwan uh, side now. Yes. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, but you, you're right. like, uh, this a uh, we, <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's not a good practice. I won't typically. I won't suggest this because. Uh, well, at least you should report it like what I did here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Peter, do you have any more questions from the from the Taiwan students or yourself? Uh, no. 
Yeah, I think this time is about yeah, it's about yeah. ten, right? Yeah. Two more minutes. Yeah. Yeah, we should let um Johnny go, right? <laughs> and also, I just want to come and uh, Carl, you did a good job in your class. See, and so Tianyi has so many questions about. Oh <laughs> yes, I hope so. Obviously, yeah. yeah. Looks uh, one more question from Julie, and uh -huh. Julie is asking the NA combined exploratory. And CA to CFA together. Julie, is this what the question is? Julie? Because because I see the the uh, indirect one look like exploratory kind of factor analysis. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Uh, which uh, are you referring to the earlier CFA? Oh, their mother, mother education with indirect and direct influence on the math score. I think that's kind of an exploratory kind, right? The mediator, uh, mediator effect. Uh, well, it's arguably you could see like uh, exploratory or confirmatory, and SEM overall is a confirmatory mm -hmm. technique. So, which means um, you first specify a model based on your theory, and yeah. then you want to check, test whether the model fits your data or not, whether your data model fits together. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a strong there's a there's a reason we put the home environment here because we know like a home environment uh, can be hypothesized as a potential mediator. Um, there are some like exposure analysis, for example, now people using the lasso, so you can input uh, many different uh, potential mediators here, and then you you decide like which one is a significant one. So in that case, mm -hmm. you can combine both like a, a confirmatory method and exploratory method together. Yeah, but here is a purely like confirmatory model. Yeah, lasso meth method is uh, uh, actually is try all these combinations and uh, try to ex extract the best combination or the best variables. Yeah, this is a, a yeah a, a very powerful, a very uh, a useful method. Now, I think uh, good, good. Now it looks like um, Dr. John can give uh, three more. <laughs> he, he, he is he's an expert in so many different areas. Statistics, SEM, and uh, social network analysis, and also uh, machine learning methods. Too, I can tell he's uh, using a lot of machine learning uh, 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 terminologies. Too. Okay, I think uh, uh, if we do not any uh, uh, more further questions, I think I will let uh, Dr. Pen in the Taiwan side wrap up. And uh, 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 oh, I want to one, do one more thing before. Maybe after Dr. Penn uh, make the concluding remarks, I want to talk about the next series of our presentation or, or webinars. Yeah. Okay, that's what Thank I'm you about. Thank you very much, um, Peter, for, for the invitation. I'm very glad to give the talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And it's, it's really wonderful. Yeah, I never thought of being using the network as a variable in the SAM. So uh, it's really eye opening. Thank you very much. And um, so I don't have any. You know, except you know, compliments, it's still compliments. Thank you. So, why why don't you, um, Carl, uh, just um, tell the audience and announce that the next the next talks by Jacob uh, Bowers. Do you want to share the screen um, of the? Sure, chat? definitely. I'm doing it now. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do that. And uh, now we are. Let me introduce to you. Oops. Uh, do you see the screen? Not yet. Not yet. OK, let me see if uh, this is working here. Let me do one more time. Uh, can you see it now? Hmm. See it, yep. OK, now, yeah, and uh, in US, uh, the next week we have a Thanksgiving break and uh, in, in school we call it fall break and the whole week will be off. So we will take one week off next week and the week after next week we will have uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, scholars 
His name is uh, Jake Bowers. Uh, Jake is a award winning author and also his topic or his research direction is very much in line with uh, what Peter and I are doing, which is to, to, to look at the policies, how much we can apply data science in the, the policy studies of particularly public policy. And uh, Dr. Bowers will will give a lecture on now. This will be on the 29th, which is a Monday. Uh, in in the time in the Taiwan case, will be a Tuesday. So uh, uh, it's a very special date. Uh, but I, I really appreciate that you mark in the calendar and uh, join us. And the topic of this talk is how can government overcome COVID-19 vaccination hesitancy. So in the U.S., a lot of uh, the population, part of the major part of the population, are still uh, very uh, 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 resistant to the to the vaccination, and they are not uh, they are agnostics about the vaccine whether the vaccine will work or hurt better or more. So uh, Dr. Bowers has some real data and uh, talking about new methods and uh, to study how uh, data science could be used for studying policy and uh, in this case uh, the vaccine policy. And uh, please join us. And um, you can go to a data and, uh, analytics colloquium and uh, to register for this uh, webinar. And after then, we have a couple. Of, uh, we have a, a duo series in uh, in the first uh, second week of December, also set seven and nine. And uh, Harold Clark uh, of UDD, uh, uh, Christopher Aiken of Princeton, and uh, Jeff Gill of American Universities. They will give uh, two two talks also. One is on the multinomia probate, and, uh, and if you remember Professor Aiken, he's coming back. And uh, Jeff Gill will talk about a new topic called is uh, data science uh, or is political science actually a data science? So this is a, uh, this should be a very interesting topic to to all social science students or political science students or policy science students. Please uh, stay tuned. Don't don't miss this uh, this uh, uh, sequence of talks. All right. Uh, uh, Hand it back to uh, Dr. Pen. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I just want to say that that's really, really heavyweight double headers. Uh, so just remember to come back uh, in December. And uh, for the next one, I think that's what I'm going to say as a policy. Actually, I was about to ask um, Johnny about, you know, we are all policy guys and how can we uh, apply this? Of course, this um, depends on our imagination, right? <laughs> and then <coughs> uh, hopefully, you know, we have any questions that uh, we can get back to you and then uh, you can give us some advice on how to use this method, uh, applying this method to the policy context. All right. And all right. thank you. Yeah, thank you again. And thanks everyone for joining us this um, this evening or uh, this morning. And uh, I hope to see you soon, uh, two weeks from now. And you guys have a great night and a great morning, great day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Hi, Carl. Hi. Thank you, Johnny. Happy to be there. Nice to meet you. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Let me see. This is not uh, recording. Thank you, Dr. Ho, Dr. Pan, and Dr.